皆さん、こんにちは。トレジャーデータの若原です。えー、私はトレジャーデータでエヴァンジェリストとして活動させていただいております。えー、今日こちらのセッションをご覧になっていただきましてありがとうございます。えー、早く本編を見たいところだと思うんですけれども、えー、私の方からですね、今回のゲストと、まあ、趣旨について簡単にご紹介させてください。えー、今回はですね、2人のスペシャルなゲストをお迎えしてまして、まず1人目が、えー、Code for Japan の代表、関さんです。で関さんは、えー、最近の活動で言うと、東京都もですね、新型コロナウイルス対策のサイトを立ち上げる動きを主導されていたりですとか、そういったことで有名になられている方です。で、もう一人はですね、台湾のデジタル担当大臣、オードリー・タンさんをお迎えしています。で、オードリーさんもですね、最近で言うと、新型コロナウイルス対策の文脈で、台湾のですね、マスクの在庫の可視化のシステムを立ち上げることを主導されていたりと。いうようよなな活動をされてて非常に有名に有名られている方ですで今日はですね、このお二人をお迎えしまして、そのマスクの在庫管理のシステムですとか、東京都のコロナウイルス対策サイトの話も出るかもしれないんですけれども、もう少し大きめ,大きめの話、データと社会はどういう関係性であるべきなのかというあたりをお二人に伺っていきたいなと思っています。はい、では、早速本編ご覧ください。どうぞ。Uh, so today we'd like to uh, draw from uh, Audrey's past interviews that we know of and we want to uh, dive deep into uh, discussions. Uh, so let's set the premise for the first question. Uh, this is what we read in one of your interviews, and this was a response uh, from Audrey uh, to the question, uh, were there uh, oppositions, especially from the senior generation when you were first brought into cabinet? Let me just read this out loud for the audience. Um, so what Audrey said was, I am working with the government, not for the government. I am merely a channel between generations, sectors, and cultures. So given that, let's move on to the question itself. We want to ask about your position and role. So when we hear minister in Japan, it would seem like a person at the top of the hierarchy of the government, very high up. So in a sense, unreachable. However, when we look at what you said, uh, it seems very different. You are a different kind of minister. We're curious to know why you use the word with, that you're working with the government. And you said that you are uh, the channel, your role was a channel. So could you describe to us how you see your position and your role? Certainly. Um, very happy to uh, participate in this deep dive, uh, and I will first say that I usually say I'm a lowercase minister. In the English language, a uppercase minister corresponds to the Japanese idea of daijin, which is a state official of the high rank, but a lowercase minister is just an advocate. <laughs> So in a lowercase minister role, anyone can be a lowercase minister. And this corresponds to the Mandarin idea uh, of my actual position, which is called Shu Wei Zheng Wei, a delegate for digital that is plural, because Shu Wei digital in Mandarin also means plural, many. So uh, my answer to this question would be that I'm a channel in the sense that we are in a chat room channel. I merely provide a space for the various different positions to find its common values. And it's not about me, it's about the space that I help making. Just one example, 
every day uh, I work in a way that is radically transparent. So this interview is also being filmed and will be published on the internet on Creative Commons, enabling anyone, including hip hop singers, to remix. Uh, and this enabled everyone to look through the various visits with me other people's positions from a safe distance to find their common values. This is opposed to traditional um, offices where uh, it's closed room meeting or it's not transparent so that people um, will feel um, like uh, siloed from each other. For me, radical transparency is at the root. That's it. Uh, thank you so much for uh, your uh, answer. The, the uppercase versus lowercase example is really easy to understand. Thank you. And then uh, building on that, I have an additional question. So you mentioned channel or a chat room. So you're providing space for people to come and discuss. Uh, how is that possible, do you think? One, you mentioned that you have radical transparency. However, how did the government first, say, allow you or let you you have this radical transparency how how did that happen well back in 2014 we sort of invited ourselves in uh, when we occupied a parliament uh, it, it started as a protest on the street for the cross strait service and trade agreement that was not deliberated substantially by the parliament so people occupied the parliament to do the MPs work for them in a radically transparent fashion <laughs> So many demonstrations were about shouting, uh, about getting the ideas across. However, the Occupy at the 2014 is about a demonstration of listening, of how we can listen at scale with half a million people on the street and many more online to get a set of consensus around the CSSTA. After the Occupy at the end of 2014, all the mayors that supported the open government vision, regardless of their political party, gets elected, and people who didn't, didn't get elected. And so that become a new political norm, and we, the facilitators and people who helped the Occupy, uh, gets invited to the cabinet as reverse mentors to the cabinet. So in a sense, my position uh, here it's just continuing the work that I worked as a reverse mentor starting at the end of 2014, as well as the municipal work, for example, by the Tainan city mayor Lai Qingde, later our premier, or the Taipei city mayor Ke Wenzhe. They were also advocates of open government. So it's not just about me, it's about a new political norm in Taiwan. Yes, uh, I've uh, distilled it down to three factors. That's fast, fair, and fun. On the fast uh, factor, for example, every Wednesday, anyone can come to my office and talk about anything. They don't even need to book my time. And if they have an idea, uh, within the next week, that becomes new policy, and I will let them know. For example, our recent stimulus package uh, did not have an option where you can get cash from ATM. But because someone visited me and uh, said, why don't you just uh, give people money through the ATM? That's uh, become now uh, an option. So people understand uh, when they have a good idea, it just takes a week or even just a few days for it become policy. <laughs> to be precise, starting next Wednesday, if you um, t uh, go outdoor instead of on the e-commerce, if you go outdoor, and spend uh, 10,000 uh, Japanese yen, uh, you can go to the nearby ATM in another week uh, to get back the cash, um, about two thirds of that back. And that's how we deliver the stimulus package. Uh, or if you do not prefer ATM, you can also pre-order a paper based uh, voucher uh, and also collect it uh, starting next Wednesday, uh, 24 hours a day in a nearby convenience store. Um, so what I'm getting to is that it's the technology adapting to people. It's not asking people to adapt to technology. And this is what I mean by fairness. 
so all of it is delivered in a way that is、um, very joyous. That is to say, makes people feel joy uh, and fun uh, when when they see the communications and so on.、Uh, as you can see, it's very ceremonial, <laughs>、uh, and and that is、uh, again why people would like to spread、uh, the message、uh, instead of、um, waiting for the government to tell them how to、uh, spread a message. Everybody can remix and create their own. Viral videos to explain how the policy works. So, if you go to the stimulus voucher website, three thousand dot gov dot tw, at the end of the website, it says、uh, every single thing you see here is open data,、uh, and you can even find a GitHub repository if you want to help translating or、uh, modifying it, and that is、uh, makes it even more fun because our service delivery、uh, enables more creativity for the whole society. That's my answer. Three thousand three zero zero zero. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Especially around the、um, the second point on fairness, we have、uh, follow up questions later. So let's draw on that、uh, when we come to that question too. Let's turn the microphone to Mr. Seki. So he uh, is uh, the representative of Code for Japan, and we see that what Mr. Seki does is、uh, similar to what you do, Audrey,、uh, in Japan. So let's draw from his ideas on what could be good points in Japan and what issues that Japan might be having. Uh, so, Code for Japan started in 2013.、Um, we were inspired by、uh, what damage and then how resilient we were after the Eastern Japanese earthquake、uh, that hit Japan. And、uh, we are a civic tech uh, community uh, working on Gov Zero. So we can see that there are similarities and also differences in、uh, how we see this、uh, civic tech in Japan and Taiwan, and we I especially want to just draw on the differences. For example, in Japan, and I think this is some、uh, this somewhat works well in Japan is that、uh, the community are kind of dispersed.、Uh, we have a, a broader、uh, geography, and there are local communities that work、uh, well within Code for Japan. And、uh, say the issue or something that we still have to work on is、uh, around the political influence.、Uh, for example, you mentioned、uh, whether it be uppercase or lowercase minister. We in the whole of Code of Japan, there are many people that who can imagine that technology. Someone who is really good at technology can. Come into say cabinet, so we're still grassroots, and we don't see that say bridge from the grassroots to the mainstream or say political influence. And related to that,、uh, from my perspective, I think that civilians or individuals who are really deeply in tech don't really have that say jump through the boundary of、uh, being co well communicating to government or saying something or. Or themselves being within the government, we still can't really see that. So I think that's something we still need to work on. Thank you, Mr. Seki, for your comment. Well, for myself, I what what I hear from Audrey is just I am just in awe, like oh wow, that is happening, and、uh, I am really pleased too to hear from Mr. Seki that we can look forward to a future like what Audrey did, because there are civilians in Code for Japan really deeply、uh, rooted in tech. But then, if you open, if they can become more aware of what they can do,、uh, I think that could become. A good、uh, outcome, so I'm getting courage from this discussion. Thank you. Hi. So let's move on to the next question, and from the next questions,、uh, it will be around data. So for the second question, the premise or the reference that we want to use is this. 
Uh, so this we know, uh, Audrey, you mentioned this uh, movement back in your uh, answer for the first question, the Sunflower Student Movement, and this is what you said. Uh, so let me just read this out loud. The people discovered that demonstrations and protests are not riots or acts of destruction, uh, but actions that show that people have opinions. But politics progresses because people participate. So, with comparison to what you said, this is the second question around give and take of data, who owns and who uses data. Uh, so, uh, when we look at the uh, interaction uh, between government and people, uh, it's important that the organization who uses data uh, return benefits to those who provided the data, meaning the, the regular people out there. Uh, however, in many cases, we see issues uh, or it's very difficult to define what benefit can be to these people and also how to deliver the benefits. And in terms of politics, I have a feeling that people who provide data have the awareness or intention that they want to the data to be used in their benefit. However, data itself, it doesn't have intentions. So how do we balance that? And in terms of politics and data, uh, say people who are aggregating that needs to listen to the people and understand the wants or the needs of the people and give back. However, uh, how is, would that be possible? And uh, what do you think is as the critical point for this uh, utilization of data from the government? So before I, we talk about data, um, let's talk about labor. Before uh, the invention of unions and cooperatives, there were uh, once, um, many centuries ago, well, a few centuries ago, uh, where the capitalists were seen only as aggregators of labor. And uh, each employee at that point, uh, there were no uh, ideas about knowledge management or knowledge worker. So each employee is treated more or less interchangeable with any other employee. That is to say, people become um, reified, uh, become like a object uh, because they were traded uh, only by the dollar value of their labor without thinking about how uh, social innovation, that is to say innovation organization, can enable people to work better together as a organization instead of as atomized individuals. So, as you can see, when people intentionally provide opinion, that's your graphic on the right, people understand they're participating in the democracy. On the other hand, if people are just being monitored or surveilled, they're not in a democracy. They could be in a totalitarian regime. So for an organization to engage people, uh, I think there are two main ways, just like um, uh, knowledge management ideas, two main ways to improve uh, the relationship. One is about accountability, explaining automatically to everyone who trusted you with their data, how these data are being used and uh, answer to each and every question from them, including updating, deleting, and otherwise making use of the data. And the second thing, uh, in addition to accountability, is to make sure that people uh, retain governance, retain control on the ultimate value of the data. For example, if someone provides data but say, I do not want this data to be used in such and such purposes, there need to be a way that's as easy for them to do that uh, for opt-out as for opting-in. 
and this is uh, when applied to labor, very intuitive, and nobody now think uh, a company only as labor aggregator. And we think uh, that data is going to be uh, very much uh, the same kind of uh, labor-based uh, organization types that enable novel ways of collaboration that will also need this, the same kind of shift in mindset. That's my answer. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, response. The analogy of labor is uh, just spot on. Really. So uh, we want to add a question to that. For example, in Japan, uh, we have this uh, word or uh, a movement that is around a revolution of work. So it's not just people going into work and then just working without thinking of thinking anything or just doing what the company tells them to do. Uh, each one of us are becoming more aware of what is work or how do we want to work or what's a healthy relationship between a company and a person that works there. So that's been uh, the premise in Japan. And the reason for that movement is that people can gather information from anywhere, from, say, friends or from the international community and look at other examples and say, oh, this is what's happening in other worlds. Why don't we do that? Or if we change our work style into something different, this would be the outcome. Why don't we try that? So that's uh, that mind shift is uh, going on because of the the available information. And I think that would be uh, put into data, the world of data as well. Not just the organization that aggregates data would be aware of that, but the people who are providing data uh, are becoming aware of how the data is getting used. So this is a question to you, Audrey. So if this mind shift in the data world is to happen, say, more easily or with more impact, what do you think is the key or what do you do in uh, in your uh, work, line of work so that people can be more aware of how their data is used? Um, so uh, on the two um, pillars of accountability uh, and participatory governance, I will first talk about accountability. In Taiwan, uh, there's uh, millions of people who have downloaded an app, uh, and it's called or the National Health Insurance app. I will call it the NHI app. Um, millions of people, um, I think four or five million, uh, have used the uh, My Health Bank function within the NHI map, uh, app. Even though um, your dentist may not be able to see uh, your um, health uh, records uh, when you, for example, did your health check uh, with your cooperative or company, uh, or that uh, your uh, smart um, home uh, appliances may report some numbers for your uh, health monitoring that is accessible only to your family members or so on, uh, everything can be aggregated, but only the person uh, themselves can see it on the health bank app. So, for example, and this is a funny example, when people check their uh, health bank, uh, sometimes they see, uh, because they can see all the x-ray or CT scan, they can even download the image, they can also see uh, the declaration of symptoms uh, from their all doctor visits, uh, and there's uh, someone who uh, gets diagnosed uh, of nose allergy, uh, and uh, uh, which is with the code 98. Uh, but some uh, a person has their doctor key it, it in as uh, 99. Uh, and so that is um, this for unknown reason. Uh, and so they can challenge uh, the diagnosis very easily and correct the typos made by the doctor. And on the participatory governance, uh, I'm going to use a uh, or a light-hearted uh, example, which is uh, people who have not collected the rationed mask, uh, they can share uh, their uncollected quota to dedicate their uncollected mask to people, uh, for example, in Japan for international help. 
and you can already see uh, almost uh, 700,000 people have now dedicated more than 5 million medical masks uh, in this link that I just provided at TaiwanCanHelp.com.tw. <laughs> So using the same app uh, as the app uh, with the health bank, people can voluntarily exchange their uncollected mask quota for the right to display their name publicly, uh, as I shared on the second link here. So you can see Pang Fong uh, has dedicated 36 uh, mask uh, pieces. However, only six is from me. The other is by other people who share my name, like Tang Feng Xian, Tang Feng Ming, and Tang Feng Ping. So that's my example and my answer. Uh, so the next question's premise is this, uh, when you were asked around the surveillance society, and uh, we know that, uh, you mentioned that we know that social sector should own data. And the question we want to ask is this, who should own data? So the completeness of data, or if data is collected in one place, it's more efficient, you can do so much more. However, there's also unfairness, meaning uh, that place or that person or that institution owns and inspects data. So in order to for a uh, government or anyone who collects data uh, to avoid authoritarianism or to avoid uh, abuse of use of data, uh, what would be needed? And we imagine that one of your uh, response would be that the social sector should be in an important role. And we also uh, expect probably from what you said, accountability is a key point for this. So Audrey, what do you think uh, should happen in terms of uh, centralizing and fairness of data? So um, I will again use uh, labor as an example. Of course, before we have all this telecommunication technology, people, uh, everybody working in the same place is more effective. Nobody will dispute that. <laughs> However, uh, there is a limit. It's not just say you put uh, thousands of people in the same room, they will magically work better. Or if everybody worked very long hours, 20 hours um, a day or 23 hours a day, they will work better. It's not like that. In fact, if you only have volume and velocity, but you, if you don't have veracity or quality, then it's as good as, um, I don't know, uh, Karoshi or something uh, when it comes to labor. So um, it, nowadays, uh, we don't think about just putting more people in the same large room anymore. We think about, as you have mentioned, uh, a revolution uh, in the mindset about labor so that people can work in a way that provides sustainability, not only for their individual, but also sustainability for the organization. Just as in the social innovations of crowdfunding, crowdsourcing, people working on the same collaborative document and so on, enabled a smarter way of working. So has recent uh, social innovation enabled us to think beyond the uh, exclusive control model of ownership of data. For example, using the same national health uh, system, you can take your national health card to your nearby pharmacy and uh, get the rationed masks. Uh, if you're an adult, then nine masks per two weeks. If you're a child, then 10 masks per two weeks. But once you do so, you can see on uh, more than 100 applications, uh, the real-time uh, stock level of the pharmacy actually deplete by nine or 10 when you make a purchase and it refreshes just after a few minutes. And because of that, it's like a distributed ledger that makes everybody accountable to each other without a single centralized source of truth. 
So uh, distributed ledger is just one. Uh, we have distributed identity, federated learning, uh, homomorphic encryption, a lot of new innovations that will enable new kinds of organization around data. Because of time, that's my answer. Uh, thank you, Audrey. Let's turn the microphone to Mr. Seki, and uh, we also want to know about the Japanese situation of how the data is used, and also the transparency and the healthy relationship is really important. And uh, well, what, how do you see this uh, from a Japanese civic tech point of view? ま、uh, thank you very much, Audrey. Uh, I, uh, it was really easy to understand that the two points, one, the, the accountability and what you expressed as political participation as your answer in the former question, uh, really sunk in because what I feel is probably lacking in the Japanese civic tech community is the participation mindset. Mm. Because what I see in Japan is that personal information uh, should be protected. Like it's coupled with the notion of fear. So if it's not protected, it's a problem. Or if it's not protected, it's going to be abused. So this notion of personal information and fear is really tied in. And through that, however, with this COVID-19 situation, uh, I think people have realized that your personal information or privacy can be coupled well and work well with public health. For example, GPS tracking apps that would tell you that you might have uh, been in contact with someone that has COVID-19. So you can that, that your data can be used to protect yourself. And then if you have the control to opt in or opt out of these um, services that you that does benefit to you. Uh, so from the discussion today, in Japan, uh, there has been this uh, My Number card, which is around your identity in uh, technology. Um, if we could uh, engage more people to participate in this movement, uh, more people would have this My Number card. The My Number card is used by really few uh, people currently, but then we want to, we have to think of how to communicate the benefits of of data being used in a civic way uh, with transparency so that we can uh, reap the, the benefits of data uh, together. Uh, thank you very much, both of you. Uh, we now kind of are made aware of the, the issue of personal information that is just uh, gives you the type of fear, but then if we are able to communicate with more transparency and clarification, that this could be used in a very beneficial way. With personal information, uh, people might be embarrassed in some way to, uh, say, disclose some aspects of yourself. For example, uh, I've gained weight recently is not something that I'm really proud of. However, uh, if I know that I have control over what should be disclosed or what should be given in and what should not, or if I can opt in or opt out from a service, uh, to know that something is beneficial to me, but also to the society society is uh, something that's encouraging for people to uh, give personal data. So let's move on to the next question and the premise is this. So this is something that you mentioned responding to a question around technology disparity or the gap issue between the senior and the young or the urban and suburban areas. And let me read this out loud, that human need not accommodate to digital technology. Digital technology should be more humble. It should be for humans. We should make sure that people can benefit from technology. So given this premise, let's talk about data technology and how it can be uh, humble or modest. 
And I think this is a really important point and probably related to what you mentioned as the fairness of uh, data. And I don't think that anyone would deny this. However, uh, myself included, when uh, a person, when people hear data or technology, it can be a bit overwhelming. It's a big word, and some people may think, you know, that it's magic that can solve all these things, or it could be a source of fear that, say, AI is going to take away my job type of fear. And uh, some people might think blindly that, you know, technology is something that's really, really important and it's kind of out of reach. So our question is this to Audrey, when we have this overbearing mind, how are we to make possible that data and technology is used fairly by and to all people? How are we to think about it and how are we to realize this future? A lot of this is about the stories we tell or about the language, uh, just to make sure that uh, nobody confuse IT uh, with the digital vision. Uh, this is my job description that I just pasted. Uh, when we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning, when we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And when we hear the singularity is near, let's remember the plurality is here. So the question is AI going to take away my job goes away if you call it assistive intelligence, not artificial intelligence. <laughs> If you have a human assistant or your secretary, uh, you will, of course, uh, trust them to align with your values, that's participatory governance, and uh, explain when they make a decision that seems to uh, be in contradict of those values, that's called accountability. If your assistant don't do that, you will fire the assistant. So this is not about uh, data and technologies being humble. That is just the consequence. The cause is that uh, we insist on human dignity. And if you insist on human dignity, the humbleness will follow. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that's something we really need to think of because as technology vendors, we tend to you know, use big words and enforce that tech is great, but it's not that, right? So, Mr. Se let's move on to what Mr. Seki has to say around this overbearing uh, language of technology and how we are to deal with it. Uh, so, with Code for Japan, we had that same kind of issue, say, like words like open data or civic tech was new, and also it didn't sound very human. And because we are good with data or good with technology, we tend to want to solve everything in technology or with technology. Uh, however, we realize that that wouldn't work on the ground, and if you want to engage more people, for example, people in the government aren't really around tech. They, they have an issue, not that they want to use open data. So we stepped back and said, what do we want to solve? Like, why are we doing this? Who are we serving? And then if we found solutions in technology, we would do that. And in that way, uh, we would build trust and build something that actually people use. So we started doing that from around four years ago when we realized that this, is, this has become an issue. So it's not tech first. It's people first, who are we serving, what issue are we tackling? And we say this in Code for Japan, that we think together and create together so that technology comes together with people. ありがとうございます。
And、uh, I want to ask an additional question to Audrey.、Uh, I heard from somebody, I think, that、uh, we don't call something that we were born with technology.、Uh, for example, for myself, when I was born, telephones were already there. So it came natural that it's a mean. To do something. However,、uh, when we encounter something new、uh, as an adult, that would kind of be overbearing and、oh, oh, we tend to overrate that. So, my question to you, Audrey, is this How should we keep our mindsets、uh, in a, a neutral or a natural way, even when we encounter new technology that might scare us in a way? How do we just plainly see it as a means to help ourselves? When I was born in 1981, Taiwan was still under martial law. And Taiwan would not get presidential election until 96 when I was 15 years old. So I guess for me, democracy is a technology. Even though I was not born、uh, in a democratic society, we can still help each other to build a democratic society. And that is、uh, the main idea of fast, fair, and fun. Because、uh, if this is new,、um, people of course have fear, uncertainty, and doubt. However, fast, fair, and fun, to my、uh, experience, is a very effective way to turn those negative energy into co creation energy. So, my main advice、uh, would be just to take anything you're afraid of, anything that seems strange to you. Uh, and see if you become curious in some part of it. Once you engage your curiosity and find a community like Code for Japan, the curiosity will、uh, vaccinate you against、um, the kind of outrage or fear. If you have a community that s h a r e food together、uh, and also s h a r e music together, maybe、uh, it's easier to see that you can then share technology uh, together uh, rather than it being an oppressive tool. It will become something that people like a musical instrument, people can practice together. That's my answer. <laughs> Uh, we prepared some additional questions if we have time, and I think Audrey, you just nailed it answering a part of what we wanted to ask. So let me just draw that up. So let me set this premise.、Uh, this was around、uh, the division of、uh, technology and how the society can be divided. And it's, it's really long, so I'm not going to read it. But what struck me was the last、uh, line that you said that I would fear a world where there is just the mainstream. Uh, so that struck me and got me thinking that if we are to build a community, it's a comfort zone because we all think alike and we're like minded people. However, we need to use our curiosity and also courage so that we can keep getting better in a sense. So, this is、uh, the question that we prepared. So, our question to you is what is a good way to get out of one's comfort zone? And also, I was intrigued about you,、uh, your mathematical、uh, theory of taking two people out of each community and let them exchange with each other. Why two and how does that work? And, and what would your answer be to getting out of a comfort zone? Okay.、Um, let's、uh, first look、uh, at the Transcultural、uh, practice is just like learning a human language or a computer language.、Um, even if Java and JavaScript are completely different languages, learning one will make it easier for you to learn the other. So, the point here being、um, it's、uh, like a la uh, language learning. Uh, Of course, the language you are born with, you probably did not remember how you learn it. But for each language that you learn intentionally, it makes it easier for you to learn future languages. So,、um, in, if you are a programmer, the hardest part to becoming a programmer is now usually solved by things like Scratch 
where you don't have to learn any language. It's just some Lego blocks fr from uh, some other kid, and you change those Lego blocks to um, change its color or its music or something, uh, remixing each other's work. So uh, just by remixing, this culture is easier uh, than if you have to start learning a new language from scratch. And building on the scratch language, uh, you can then learn other computer languages. So it's an easy way to get out of one's comfort zone if you uh, find something that's useful to you, it's already 90% there and you just have to learn the 10% to make it truly useful in your life. And so um, each of those communities that I referred to before served as uh, hubs that connect people together in a small world network. So um, of course there is already an established theory about network robustness. I will not quote uh, the textbooks. Uh, please feel free to uh, introduce the audience about network robustness and design. And this uh, applies to human network as well as to computer networks. For a uh, old but useful uh, um, exposition on this, uh, you can read Clay Shirky, uh, Here Comes Everybody. Uh, so this is this was a response to uh, what you mentioned uh, around the situation of today, meaning the COVID-19 situation, uh, that the current moment is a great opportunity for governments to try out and experiment uh, new uh, technologies or methodologies. And the reference here is that you mentioned that uh, you don't think that people will forget the positive side of uh, what they experience with technology. So given that, uh, as a background, uh, our request is that please give a message to the audience who are working with data or technology uh, given the COVID-19 situation. Okay, um, I will simply uh, quote uh, Lena Cohen, uh, the, my favorite uh, poet, uh, in the first stanza of the song Anson. <laughs> The birds they sang at the break of day, start again, I heard him say, don't dwell on what has passed away or what is yet to be. Yeah, the wars, they will be fought again. The holy dove, she will be caught again, bought and sold and bought again. The dove is never free. Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets. That's very inspiring. ということであの長時間ありがとうございました。あの今日いただいたお話があの発表させられるきっかけであるとかこれからを歩んでいくヒントがになっていれば我々としても非常に嬉しいです。ということで本当に今日は長時間オードリーさん、関さん本当にお付